so great, so great to see you guys here today. Let's spend the next um, 30 seconds to a minute to greet the people around you. Handshake, hug. Spirit, breathe on us. Spirit, breathe on us. Faith, open us. Bring your peace and joy. And come and fill us, Lord. Yeah. Spirit, breathe on us. Faith, open us. us into a time of honesty and confession with the Lord. 
a time of being clear about our brokenness and our need for him. And as we do that, we're going to sing this song, Lord, I Need You. And as the Lord, as we have just called upon the Holy Spirit, we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us, speak into our hearts. And then as he speaks, I invite you to then to respond with confession or gratitude as he prompts. So as we sing, you're doing two things. You're listening and you're singing back. sing these words of hope over our hearts as a savior who loves us who died for our sins and offers us new life and hope in him Jesus 
Jesus, you love me. And your heart is for me. You give grace and power to the weak and poor. And Jesus, you love me. You're good in all you do, and my soul belongs to you. You are hope and peace in my brokenness, Jesus, you're good to me. Oh, what a us for that and bring us into your arms Lord as we as we spend this time in worship and preaching and teaching Lord fill us with your spirit and fill this place Lord in Jesus name
Amen. Please be seated. As we, uh, as we transition into our offertory time, I want to draw your attention to three ways that you can give, and that's outside of the, uh, the baskets that are coming through here. Um, you can uh, find us on the web at uh, crossingscommunity.org forward slash give. Um, you can also text to 803-913-3338. And of course, you can, I think I lost my mic. It's going in and out, sorry. Um, you can also uh, mail check or whatever to 2831 Clemson Road, our address here. Uh, I want to take a moment and, uh, and pray over our tithe here this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for gathering us. Thank you for the providence in our lives of which you instruct us to give back. Lord, um, work in our hearts to trust you to give back. And Lord, take these gifts, this humble offering that we bring, and multiply it to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, I'm wondering if those those flowers, is that a nod to Master's Week? I don't know who's on slides uh, back there, but uh, hey guys, I'm Brandon, if I didn't say that already, and I just want to give us a little update on a ministry that we started about a month ago. We've been in the works with this ministry for months now, and we introduced it to you uh, back in March. It is Bless Ministry, and basically what it is is a prayer ministry for our neighbors. And, of course, you can see the QR code there if you haven't signed up already. And I just wanted to give us a little update on what God has been doing in that uh, with your partnering and praying for neighbors. So check this out. We have 82 folks in our congregation signed up and praying for neighbors and friends weekly. Um, there's tons of different ways to set that up. I love to have my prayers sitting in my inbox in the morning. So that I, uh, when I open my email, oh yeah, time to pray, time to stop and pray. Some of you like it in the afternoon to get a little notification there, to reminder. You can download the app that gives you notifications on your phone. You set up email, that type of stuff. You can go in and customize people that you want to be praying for, a circular area you want to be praying for. But check that out. That's 82 folks in our congregation praying. And check this out. This is really cool. We have prayed 4,490 4, times. That many prayers have been prayed by our congregation for our friends and neighbors around us. You think about that. That's a lot of prayer. And what's really exciting about prayer is it's, the, it's not us moving God's heart or convincing God of something or like, hey, God, will you, will you please love this neighbor? Will you please show this neighbor your love and salvation? It's really us connecting with God's heart of love and compassion that he already has for our friends and neighbors. So Think about all the influence that God has had on us in those 4,500 prayers. And we are praying for, check this out, we have adopted or we're praying for 2,130 homes. That's really cool, guys. That is really, really cool. I, I heard a story the other day of one of our folks here uh, it, doing the prayer ministry. Um, he gets a DoorDash to his door, right? And he looks, he's like, I, I didn't order DoorDash, I wonder. So he's able to go into his uh, app and he's able to look up his neighbor and see, oh, this, this, uh, this DoorDash goes down here, you know, and able to make the connection or whatever. It's, it's amazing to see those little things and how God can take those little tiny things and use them uh, for his glory and for his good and loving our neighbors around us. So if you haven't signed up for that, please do. Um, you can shoot the QR code. It's so simple. And when you sign up, you receive folks that you pray for around you. Uh, you can customize that as much as you want. And it even sends you the prayer to pray. And I've said this from the beginning. This is, this is what I need in my prayer life. I need structure. I get it in my inbox. And I, know I have names to pray for. And I have a prayer to pray. So I get prompts and structure. And so that's why we've gone with this ministry. Now, we, there will be more coming down the road. But right now, here's all I'm asking of you, is that we pray. We begin with prayer. We start with prayer and see what the Lord does as we step out in his spirit's power. So a little update. Let me, let me pray over our prayers. How about that? And uh, we'll transition. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have called us to love you with everything we have and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Thank you for the simplicity of connecting with your heart. Thank you that there's no song or dance or system that we have to do. We just get to simply reach out to you in prayer 
and to allow you to begin to influence us, allow you to begin to pour your love into us, that we would step out in your spirit's power to love, bless, and pray for those around us. Thank you for that simplicity. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you that you're a relational God and you are a loving God. We thank you so much for that. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, well, I'll dismiss the kiddos with Miss Becky over there. Good morning, Crossings family. Y'all hanging in there today? Uh, Springtime is uh, absolutely amazing, isn't it? Uh, New life, green everywhere, flowers, azaleas, um, just awesome. So good to be back with you, friends. And um, as we kick back into God's Word, we have been, um, we started about a year ago, a study in the life of King David. Y'all remember that? And we really started with him uh, when he was just a young man, probably 12, 13 years old. And we followed him to becoming king. And I'm about to kind of repeat that for us. Um, But then we took a little break. I mean, it's two books of the Bible. That's a long, long time. So we did about nine months of David. And then we took a little break and did Philippians. And now we're going to come back and finish David's life. And we're going to kick that back off today. And as we do that, I just kind of wanted to remind us of what the journey we've been on with David. Like I said, he was just 12 or 13, the scrawny boy who was just a shepherd, which was not a a good thing. He was kind of despised by his own dad. But God had said, I want this man to be the king of my people. And so God had chosen young David. And so he sends the prophet Samuel to David's dad and they line up all the kids and his dad doesn't even bring him to the ceremony. That's how little he thought of his own son. But God had thought of David and seen David and known David and said, none of these boys is it. There's another one. And so David is anointed by God to be king. And the spirit comes on him and he just has his heart for the Lord. And soon he's like taking some bananas to his brothers who are actually real soldiers and fighting a real war. And he's just this kid and he brings them to his brothers and finds out there's this giant named Goliath scaring the whole people, right? And nobody would go up and face this guy. And the guy is just mocking and cursing our God. And David's like, I'm not dealing with this. Lord Jesus, come on me. And he comes down. And the Spirit comes on David. And y'all know that story, of course. David kills Goliath. By, by 17, maybe 16 years old, he's a household name in the whole country. All the women are chanting his name. And he becomes this great general. And he, it, by 19, he's the general of the entire army. This is his like rise to fame. And Saul, the king, gets jealous and hates him. And attempts to murder him multiple times. And spends the next 13 years of Saul and David's life trying to kill David. David's on the run. He can't go home. He can't see his family. He has to hide his family and parents away in another country so they're not murdered. He's living in caves and deserts. He's running away to foreign countries. And through this whole time, what we've seen about David, which is so beautiful, is he communed with the Lord through all these hard times. Some of the best psalms, uh, Brandon uh, preached through one last week, are written during the seasons where David is hiding away uh, with no one but the Lord going, uh, protecting and guarding him. And you see this in his life. And finally, Saul is killed in battle. David has many opportunities to get revenge, but doesn't. He leaves it in God's hand. Saul's killed in battle by 37 so it's, it's this huge window of from like 13 when he's anointed to 37 that it actually takes that long for God's plan to get worked out in his life. Any of you ever taken a little while for God's plan to get worked out in your life? Anybody in here? Didn't happen the next day. It, but looking back, you can see what he was doing. Finally, David's king. He wins all these great victories. He loves the Lord. Everything's great. And there's this sin deep in his heart that we ended the first part of our study with with David which is called lust, and it owns him. He keeps marrying different women, even though God told him not to, and that's not enough. And he sees this other girl named Bathsheba, and he goes after her, and he gets her pregnant. Her husband is off fighting his wars, risking his life for King David. He has to cover it up, so he murders the husband. Remember all this? And God in his faithful does not discard David. He doesn't cast him away. 
he comes after him with a prophet, with a friend, with a story that pierces through to David's heart and causes him to realize what he has done and throw himself before the Lord. And David cries out, I have sinned against the Lord. And God says, I have put away your sin. I have forgiven you. And we've seen in, in some of the great Psalms, that was actually the one Brandon preached last week, was right after that of just him experiencing God's forgiveness. But while we might know God's forgiveness and grace, one of the things you're going to still see, and this picks back up today, is life has consequences. Actions have consequences. Just because we come before the Lord and he forgives us doesn't mean every little consequence has gone away. And what we're going to see is David's sin in his own life has devastating effects, effects on his children. Devastating effects on his family. And we're going to watch in some really rough waters and rough ways. We're going to see somehow where is the Lord in all that's about to take place in Daniel's family and in Daniel's life. I'm going to warn you, the passage I'm about to read is pretty graphic pretty horrible. Um, I'll tell you in a second, I was strongly considered just kind of skipping all of this, and the Lord's, and I'll share why in a second, said you can't. You can't. And so we're about to read what begins to play out, and I want you to think, if you were with us for 2 Samuel 11 with David with Bathsheba, the parallels you're about to see his son Amnon act out with his own sister so stand up with me and let's um, read together 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1. Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very crafty man, and he said to Amnon, O son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? And Amnon said, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said to him, Why don't you lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill? And when your father comes to see you, say to him, let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat and prepare the food in my sight that I may see and see it and eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat from her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar saying, go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, where he was lying down, and she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes, and she took the pan and emptied it out before him, but he refused to eat, and Amnon said, send everyone out from me. So everyone went out from him, and then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food into the chamber that I may eat it from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. But when she brought them near to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. As for me, where could I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of those outrageous fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he won't withhold me from you. But he would not listen to her. And being stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her with very great hatred, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, get up, go. But she said to him, no, my brother, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. He called the young man who served him and said, put this out of my presence and bolt the door after her. Now she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for thus were the virgin daughters of the king dressed. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore. And she laid her hand on her head and went away, crying aloud as she went. And her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon your brother been with you? Now hold your peace, or be quiet, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. So Tamar lived a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. When King David heard all these things, he was very angry. 
And other manuscripts like the Dead Sea Scrolls add this phrase. But he would not punish his son Amnon because he loved him since he was his firstborn. But Absalom spoke to Amnon neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. You can have a seat. Oh, Lord, this is a horrific passage to have to read, to preach. It's horrible. It's horrible. But horrible has happened in our lives. This isn't just something that happens in the Bible. Lord Jesus, thank you that you've seen our pain and you've made sure to include our pain in your word. And that you've written it there that we would see we're not alone. That our pain and our wounds and our hurts are seen by you. And I pray that right now, Father God, you would come. And you would speak through me, a very broken vessel, to just share tender words of hope and care uh, for our world. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I said at the beginning, I'd thought long and hard about, we, we were going to get back into David, and then I started reading this passage, and um, was like, Lord, can we go there? And I'm pretty nervous, I'll be honest, preaching this right now. Uh, I've been nervous in the past because maybe there was this hard word, and y'all needed to hear the truth, and I knew there were some tough things that had to be said, and some preachers kind of get nervous. Oh boy, how's, there, how's this going to go? This is not one of those. This is, we're about to go some, to some really broken, wounded places. And they're so tender. And they're so sensitive. And they're so deep. That I just pray that the, the Holy Spirit and His care and love would come on us. You know, I was talking to a number of folks who said, you know, I've heard, had a lot of people who've preached David's life, and most of them stop at chapter 12. You know, they kind of lead up to the Bathsheba sin, they preach that, and then the restoration. And, but then what we're about to see here with his family is so bad and so graphic, and the fallout is, uh, we're just not going to do that. And I find that too many, and I'm just going to put ourselves in it, too many of us churches like to airbrush reality. We like to airbrush life. Let's just preach the happy clappy passages. Let's come here to hear some pick-me-up, cheer-em-up sermons. Um, and we, of course, we need to kind of dress up a little bit, even though here we have our shirt tails out, horrible. But, you know, we put on our suits and our ties and our nice dresses, and we, you know, pull in the parking lot with a smile and a hand up to wave, and we just kind of learn some great theology and good Bible and maybe have some good friendships and take meals with each other. But we kind of leave it up here so many times, don't we, friends? And the church so many times just, it, it, you know, the main reason, our main barrier it's uncomfortable to go any deeper. It's uncomfortable to go any deeper. It's uncomfortable to press into the most wounded. And so we kind of get this little patch, and it's like this surfacy patch, right? Even though the infection and the pain and the hurt and the trauma is so much more deep. What we're going to see as we dive into this today is the three huge marks of what happens to Tamar in this passage are so common to us in this world today. Half of women, one out of two, have experienced some kind of sexual violence or abuse involving physical contact during their lifetime. One out of every other woman. One out of every third man has experienced sexual abuse during his lifetime. That included physical touch. One in four women and one in 26 men have experienced rape or attempted rape in their life. One in four. 90% of sexual assaults are committed by people the victim knew. 90%. Let's just be thinking about what the Lord is including here. This is like step for step Tamar. 2% of rape perpetrators ever serve time in prison. Two out of every hundred, just like Amnon, gets away with it scot-free. What we're going to see is this reality that we're going to see in the scriptures. It's not some distant Bible story that, no, 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 no. This is our lives. This is our past. This is our upbringing. These are our families, right? And God puts it in his word for a reason because he sees you. 
He sees you. He sees you. He doesn't airbrush. He doesn't leave us to ourselves. He doesn't ask us to be quiet. I remember um, one of my very best friends growing up. I'd known him literally since birth. We're only one month apart. We went to kindergarten through 12th grade together, and I'll never forget finding out in college that he had been horrifically abused throughout his entire life by someone in his own family. And it came to light, and that person, all that stuff came out. And you're just like, I mean, I talked to this guy almost every single day of my life and had no idea. No idea of what he was living with, the demons, the, the pain, the hurt that was there. And I in no way am trying to say one little sermon is going to somehow bring healing. That's not the goal of this sermon. I just want to do what the scripture's doing, which is just name our pain and then invite in our God who cares for us and loves us right in the midst of our pain. These kind of wounds are a lifetime of struggle, a lifetime of pain, a lifetime of anger, a lifetime of healing. I want you to notice what we just read was 22 verses. The next eight chapters of your Bible is just going to be the fallout. It's all one long story, just the fallout of this one action by this one son named Amnon to his sister. Eight chapters of pain, of hurt, of catastrophic consequences that just keep happening and happening and happening. And even at the end of the eight chapters, nothing's really resolved. It's just more carnage and more pain. That's so many times our lives as well, isn't it? You know, when these kind of things happen to us when we're young, it's not like it was just a one-time victimhood. These things just uh, continue to haunt us in our mind, in our heart, in our dreams, in our pain. These things just keep coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. And that's why it's so important that the church is not like the Germans during World War II. You know, when the Allies finally got into Germany, the so Soviets were coming in from the east, the American and British Allies were coming in from the west, and we started finding these concentration camps, the most horrific abuse you could ever conceive of, the murder of millions upon millions upon millions of Jews and others. And they would get there, and they would find... They just couldn't believe their eyes because there were German houses all around. I mean, within one mile, all these very nice church-going Germans were living right there. And the Allied soldiers would grab them out of their homes and make them walk and look at these bodies, at these skeletons, at even the living ones who, who remained. You live half a mile from here. You never saw the train cars? You never heard the cries? You never smelled the smoke? They play dumb. So many times is that not what the church has done with sexual sin, sexual pain, sexual abuse? We just play dumb. We're just like the Germans. Oh, it may be there and the Bible talks about it. And it may be it even happened, but it's just easier to just airbrush it, to leave it alone. I want you to know your God is the third person in the Good Samaritan story. You know, you've got a victim of robbery and beat up and abuse, laying on the ground, utterly bleeding, laid out. And the two church people do what? The priest and the rabbi, what do they do? What do they do, friends? They walk around on the other side. It's too messy. It's too inconvenient. It's too uncomfortable. And they leave the person there to suffer. But your Savior, we're not the Good Samaritan person, by the way. Y'all know that, right? We're not the hero in the Good Samaritan story. Jesus is. He's the one who sees us in our bleeding pain and come close to nourish us and heal us and comfort us at his own expense, at his own death and personal abuse. This is what we're going to start to see compared here. Um, last thing on this is there's so many types, and, and this one is sexual, but there's physical abuse, there's relational abuse, there's emotional abuse, there's spiritual abuse. You know, the title of this sermon series is called After God's Own Heart, and that's my prayer for this, and this is just going to kind of lead us into the next, is God, where is your heart? And that's kind of hard to discover right now. You know why? Guess how many times the word God or Lord shows up in chapter 13 of your Bible? How many times did I just read the word God or Lord? Did y'all count those? Zero. His name isn't even mentioned. It seems as if he's nowhere present. But what we're going to see is just because God seems to be absent does not mean 
he is not close to his people. Now, last thing, and then we'll jump into the text here. David has played three roles in terms of abuse in his life. One, he was a victim of abuse. He's a teenager in the king's presence, entrusted to play music for the king. And what does the king do? Throws spears at him, tries to kill him, tries to assault him. Um, He has to run for his life. And like so many sad victims, David has no other place to go. So he has to come back to his abuser. He has to keep coming back to the king. The king owns the whole country. He has to come back in there and play again for him to have another spear thrown. This happens over and over and over again. David's a victim. What do we see in 2 Samuel chapter 11? David's a perpetrator. He's the one who did the abuse to a young bride named Bathsheba. Remember that? We talked about that. David's also a third party in this. He's the overseer. And we'll see this from Tamar as as horrific as the abuse itself is, if you ever get the courage to share it with someone else and they don't believe you or they tell you to be quiet or they do nothing, that's as deep of a wound. That the very person who was supposed to protect me and care for me literally just tells me, "Mm mm-mm, probably didn't happen. I think you made it up. Or, okay, it did happen, but we're not going to do anything about it. We're going to protect the family. David does that here. He's the betraying overseer in this family who does nothing to care for his daughter Tamar and does nothing to bring justice to his son Amnon. And so as we begin to, we're just kind of naming these things right now, friends. Again, our, it, it's a lifetimes of healing. But what we're going to see as we start to, is I just want you to see very quickly five quick contrasts between sin and abuse and the God that we have. And the God that we own that we'll see in this passage and then by contrast out of this passage. Here's number one. Sin pursues in order to destroy. Sin pursues in order to destroy. What's so sick about this passage is verse 4 through 11 is Amnon plotting Tamar's rape. Did you know? Four, I mean it was... Uh, 4 through 11 is him just plotting it. This wasn't like last second. It just didn't come. No, no, no. This was premeditated of him planning and pretending. And think about how sick it is. He pretends he's her friend. I'm sick. Oh, I know Tamar. She's a good sister. I'll have her care for me. See how he's luring the whole thing in. He deceives his dad, David, right? And cons and manipulates David into having uh, approve of the whole thing. He's destroying every relationship in his sight. He's pretending like it's an honor for them to be this close, for her to feed him in his bed with her own hand. It reminds you of what the Bible says about the evil one, right? Your adversary, the devil, slaps you in the face like a roaring lion? No, what's he do? What's the word? He prowls around like a roaring lion. He sneaks. He pretends. He feigns that he is for us, that he has something good for us. He lures us in. It made me think of, i uh, got a little picture here I wanted to show you guys, of a fish. Uh, this is called uh, the anglerfish. Let's see if my little thing, okay, that's, um, oh, there we go. Y'all see that? Y'all see that little thing right there? That's part of this fish's body. This fish, God had given it this little bitty line that holds out, and that's like a lure. It's like fishing for other fish is what it's doing, right? It's luring in other fish, and this other fish sees that, thinks this is a rock, and goes for it, and bam, he eats it alive. This is so often what our God, I mean, this is what so often our enemy does to us, right? That's how sin is, ne- Satan's not stupid, right? Think about Genesis chapter 3. It wasn't that the apple was so disgusting that they ate it. He lured them in with delight. You get this? The Bible talks about it over and over and over again. Satan's no fool. He lures you in. He tricks you in. He pulls you in. That's exactly what Amnon is doing to his sister and his entire family, just and only to gratify himself and pleasure himself. That's his only goal. You know, it reminds you of what Potiphar's wife did to Joseph. Remember that story in Genesis? Exact same thing. She lures him in. She gets everybody else to leave, just like Amnon does, sets the stage, dresses inappropriately, comes to uh, Joseph, grabs him, young man, come to bed with me. It's exactly what you see. David had done the same thing with Bathsheba. 
I mean, how did it get to David sleeping with Bathsheba? This is all playing itself out. Abner just learned his tricks from his dad, right? Why is he on the roof? Why the out of battle? And he, on the roof, he knows that there's going to be women who are taking baths on their roofs because no one else can see them but their pervert king. David knew exactly what he was doing. And even when he sees her, he doesn't bounce his eyes. What's he do? He calls a servant. Wow, look at her. He invites him into the same sin. Check her out. I want her. Who is that? Oh, that's one of your most faithful servants who's sacrificing himself for you right now. I don't care. Bring her to me, right? You see how he just premeditatedly went through this. If that is sin and abuse to destroy, what is our God? Does our God plot? You better believe our God plots. Before he ever created Genesis 1-1, the Bible says Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were sitting down plotting something. You know what it was? Our rescue, our salvation, their love for us, coming after us. It wasn't this last second, oh no, this went bad. Jesus, rush, get down there. No, 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 no. They were systematically planning how they were going to reclaim us and embrace us and rescue us and love us. Just as much as Amnon so sickly plans his whole abuse strategy in order to destroy Tamar. What do we read about our Lord Jesus he, having a hundred sheep, if he has just one who is lost, does he not leave the 99 and go out into the open country? And he goes after the one that's lost until he finds it, whatever that means, wherever it is, whatever it takes. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders and returns rejoicing. That's the kind of Savior we have. So if you're those one out of two or one out of three we just talked about in this passage today or in, in our reality today, our Savior wants you to hear that as much as our life might feel like chapter 13, we have a God who has seen and who has come. Now, I'm not trying to make some little trite answer of just, oh, it's all happy because Jesus is here. Now, I'm not saying that at all, friends. But there is a bedrock truth to this, right? Of a life hidden or a, a house uh, built on the rock of the hope that I do have a God who has seen and who has cared and who has come to make this right. And to begin to care for me. That's point number one. Point number two. Sin and abuse silences our cries. Our God listens closely to our cries. So when the plan actually hatches and he grabs Tamar and he's pulling her in. And what does she do? She cries out. Verses 12 and 13. She's just, uh, uh, please brother, don't do this. Please brother. This is, this is against the word of God. Is what she's saying. In Israel, this would never happen. We're brother, sister. This is incest on top of rape. What are you doing? And do you realize the consequences? My whole life is going to be shattered. And now you're going to be the guy who does that kind of stuff. Do you realize this? She's crying out. I want you to notice verse 14. But he would not listen to her. The exact same phrase is repeated right after the fact. But he would not listen to her. That was verse 16. After the fact when she's like, please don't leave, brother. Please don't leave me like this. Verse 16. But he would not listen to her. You know what sin and abuse and pain and Satan do when you're in pain? Just sh no one cares. Shut up. Keep it to yourself. Even when she goes to her full brother, Absalom. What's Absalom say? Just keep, be at peace about it. Don't say anything. Just, it's your brother, it's too messy, just don't say anything at all. This is what you start to see being played out. Amnon obviously doesn't hear, Absalom doesn't hear, David is furious and does nothing. There's no record he even goes to his daughter. This happened to his precious little girl and he does nothing, he doesn't even go see her. That's the kind of dad David is. But that's not the kind of God that we have. Listen to Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cries. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. But the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Like I was saying before, the, the horror of one sin being committed against us is then compounded when no one will believe us or no one wants to listen to us or we're just told to not make it into a big deal. Just keep it to ourselves. You've now compounded sin upon sin and pain upon pain. That's why you see so many believers today trying to start saying something about sex trafficking that is just horrific in our nation and in our world. 
Even the recent movie, The Sound of Freedom, is just trying to bring to light what is happening in hotel rooms not far from us. When we had the talk back uh, in 2019, we had police officers come and speak to us and were pointing out the hotels and motels within two blocks of, or within two miles of this church where sex trafficking is rampant right now, right today. Now, church, shh, too messy. Let's don't talk about it. Let's leave it alone. That's not what our God says. Let me ask you a question. Because God is not spoken of in this passage, and so we can't really figure out where he is. But I got a question to ask you. How do we know this happened? How do we know word for word what happened? The prophets who wrote First and Second Samuel, Nathan, Gad, and um, there's another one. I can't remember his name. How did they know this? There were only two people in the room, Amnon and Tamar. Amnon's dead, so he's not the eyewitness, so who's left? God sent Nathan or Gad or one of his other prophets close to Tamar to say, I want to hear every word. I was with you, and I saw you, and I'm bringing comfort to you, and I'm going to send one of my messengers, one of my key leaders in the entire world to Tamar's side. I could only imagine what that conversation was between and continued to be that God would have sent someone to her to hear this account, to have it recorded, but also more importantly, to bring comfort and hope even into the midst of it. That's a key prayer for any church, right? Who can I talk to? Who can I share with? Who even wants to hear? So much of us, many of us have just been told to be silent versus finding a church family. And of course, we don't do it in a setting like this, but we find to start finding trust with just two or three people that maybe I can share. Maybe I can start to open up. Maybe I can start to pull these walls down. That's what I've got to experience through discipleship here. And with others in my life, it's like, you kind of share this much, and you watch to see how they respond to it. And if they don't have time for it, if they'll just change the subject and start talking about themselves, okay, you don't share your pain with that person. They're not safe, right? Or if they start pointing the finger back at you and judging you, all of a sudden you realize they're not safe. But maybe, just maybe, God leads you. Because remember, our God wants to come close to listen to us. We just read that. How does he listen to us so many times? Through our prayers, yes, of course, but also through his body on earth. That's your ears. Your ears. Your ears are the ears of Christ to hear and be attentive and to embrace and to love and to come close and to walk the path and maybe just to sit in despair for a season of life well, as we walk through these things ourselves. This is what we see. And of course, oh, the dear need for counseling. I can't even tell you what that has done in my life. Things that I've never shared with any other person but thank God for the confidentiality and professionalism of counseling where you can just start to go, here it is. And God start to expose and heal places I didn't even know needed to be healed in my life. This is our God, not one who silences us, but who comes close to listen. Number three, sin and abuse discards its victims, but God holds his children close. What's beyond sick about this is the second Amnon is gratified. The second he satisfied raping her. Lust turns into hate. Now, our world wants to connect lust and love, but those two things have nothing to do with each other. Lust and hate are equivalents. You get this, right? The world wants to celebrate and, and thinks passion and desire is love. That is the last thing love is. Our, I think I, I hear a lot of nuanced um, irony in this passage that the Bible keeps talking about Amnon loving his sister. He doesn't love her at all. He lusts her. Totally different. Totally different. That's why when the world is saying embrace free love, what they're saying is destroy one another. Because there's nothing free about love. It's the most costly thing you could ever give. It's nothing but sacrifice. That's why when Jesus came, he said, I've got a new command. You've never heard it before. You ready for it? Love one another. Because everything you've ever thought about love, I'm blowing out of the water. Because love has nothing to do with gratification of self and pleasuring self and what I can get out of this and what my needs are, what I think my orientation is. That's all about me versus just losing myself totally to embrace and to receive from another, right? This is what Christ has done for us. That's why he says, love one another as I have loved you. And what is love? First John 4. How God showed his love among us, he sent his one and only son into the world 
that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Friday night, I got to perform a wedding of two of our members here, Andrew Pack and Allison Bird. It was awesome. There's nothing like weddings. They're just, they're gifts from God to celebrate what eternity is going to be, right? And what Jesus says he's going to give for us. And we studied these verses, 1 John 4. Let's talk about love. This isn't just a lustful relationship of, man, you're hot and you're hot and we want each other and let, you know. No. That just makes a mockery of love. I cannot wait to lose myself for you. And do you think through the vows, plenty and want and joy and sorrow and sickness and health, up and down and whatever it is and whatever is exposed, as long as we both shall live. Wow. That's what our Lord Jesus Christ comes and brings to us. He is one who will never, ever let us go. Amnon discards her. Get away from me. Get, get her out of the room. As soon as it was over, get her out of the room. Our God says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they'll never perish. No one can ever snatch you out of my hand. Not only will I not push you out of my hands, you can't even get yourself out of my hands. I will never let go of you. I will never discard you. I will never put you down. Even in seasons of your life where you want to kind of wiggle away from me. I'm sorry, babe. I love you too much is what Jesus is saying. This is the embrace of our Father in heaven. A lot of times that's hard to believe. You know, when, when you think through things that have happened to us through life, they really serve many times to warp how we even view God. If my dad would do this... By heavenly, you know, you, it, it's hard to trust a perfect heavenly father when you've had so many faulty views on earth, right? And experience things on earth. Y'all get this? That's why it's so important, Lord Jesus, help us, help us, help us by your spirit to see you with your heart for us, your care for us. And so two more real quick. Sin of victims, God sees his children as of the greatest value. You know what, David, when David in 2 Samuel 11, it never refers to Bathsheba by her name through that whole interaction. It's always the woman, the woman. She's just an object. This passage is even worse. When Amnon, maybe you caught, it wasn't a mistake. Maybe you caught that when I was reading the text and Amnon's done with Tamar and says, calls a servant and says, and get, get this out of here. Our Bibles say woman, but the word woman is not in the Hebrew. He doesn't even identify her as a human. Just get this thing out. That's the object of what he was seeing and doing. Sin makes us see each other as objects to gratify self. As horrific as the statistics were about abuse victims, the statistics about pornography are just as bad. 68%, 70, 7 out of 10 church-going guys regularly look at porn. Over 50% of pastors regularly look at porn. 33% um, of women regularly look at porn. Just objectifying, right? We're raised on this stuff from the earliest of ages, right? That you're just an object to satisfy me. And that's what marriage is. It's just the ultimate way to satisfy myself. You see how upside down our views can be. That's what world and sin does. Jesus says, oh, no, no, no. You are the most precious thing I can ever imagine. You're of the greatest worth. When I created you, the first words out of my mouth is, you aren't good. What are you? You're what? You're very good. You're very good. And even when we turned on him and rebelled against him, what does he do? Does he just leave us there? No. You are so precious to me, I will kill God to bring you back to myself, to reclaim you to myself. I will have the second person of the Trinity become one of you and live in this painful, horrible world and experience abuse and all the things that Jesus Christ went through. And then to experience the ultimate of all pain and all death. Think about that. There are going to be molesters in heaven, guys. And that's hard sometimes to swallow. Why? Not because Jesus minimized the sin. No, 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 no. He bore the full weight of sin. All of that judgment was put on him on the cross to heal the victim and even the perpetrator in times. They're saved in Christ. This is what we see here. Why? Not because we were worthless or objects to him, but we were of utmost precious value, so much so. 1 John 3, 1, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. You're my child now, and that is what we are. 
Matthew 6. Look at the birds. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. Your heavenly Father sure takes care of them. Are you not much more valuable than they? That's what we see here is the value our God has. It doesn't objectify us. And finally, sin leaves its victims without hope. God brings justice for his children. What breaks your heart in this passage is this is about the last we're going to hear of Tamar. She is left a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. And so ends the story of Tamar. No one cares. No one on earth cares. No one on earth seems to see. No one on earth is pursuing her own daddy. There's no record he even goes. Why didn't he bring her into his house? That's his little girl. Why didn't he bring her into his house and say, baby, you're going to live with me. I will take care of you. This will never happen again, right? He doesn't do any of those things. He leaves her totally to herself. This is what you see um, there. But while David utterly fails to apply justice in this situation, our God, on the other hand, has ultimately provided justice in our situation. Remember, all these things are consequences of David's sin. David sins with Bathsheba, kills a guy, and God says one of your sons is going to die. That's part of the consequence. Ultimately, David will have four of his sons end up getting killed because of his one sin. Four of them will die. But actually, it's five. Because it's not just the four ones he had directly next in line. It was also a future son of David who would come. And how do you know God's going to bring justice? Just keep looking at the cross. Keep looking at the cross. You want to know how serious he takes this kind of stuff? Look at the cross. There were no shortcuts, no way around it, no sugarcoating, no airbrushing it, no pretending like it wasn't there. He literally took all pain and hurt and trauma and abuse and, and rape and suffering and sin and selfishness, and he took it all on him. He took it all on himself. This is the kind of heart our God has for us. Not, I don't have time for this, but I have nothing but time for this. Bring it all to me. Bring it all to me. That's what happens in Christ as, as we think of ourselves as victims. That my pain could someday, because man, it's been, a, it's been 60 years since that happened. And that still haunts me. There's going to be a day that one day we are released, that those skies open or Christ calls us home, and one day finally we're released from the ultimate pain. But there's also another day, and Jesus sure makes a point about this. This is what you wish you had seen David do. There's nothing worse than watching a dad just let something happen to his own little girl and do nothing. God says, I'm not that father. The last week of Jesus' life, over and over again, he just tells stories about the same thing. His people getting abused and him coming back and putting those place in a place where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be a celebration over hell. Usually as Christians, we don't think we're supposed to celebrate hell. That's like bad or something. No, no, no. Hell will bring glory to God. For his justice will be served. And it might seem like a long time in our lives, but in eternity, in the light of eternity, what we're going to see is we have a God who came and did not forget. He saw, he heard, and he came, and he brought his justice. Why do you think Revelation is so terrifying and beautiful all at the same time? Because if you're in Christ, it's the most glorious thing you can think of, eternity. And if you're not in Christ, it's the most devastating, horrific thing you could ever think of in eternity. But one thing's for sure, our God is on the throne and the wicked are punished, and justice is served, and his dear ones are healed, and comforted, and drawn in, and forgiven, and restored, and made whole, and called his children, and celebrating with our husband forever and ever. Friends, our Savior is the third person in the Good Samaritan story. He hasn't walked by your pain. He didn't walk on the other side. He came close, he got off his donkey like Jesus did in Jerusalem on the triumphal entry, and he didn't just tend to our wounds, he went to the cross, didn't he, friends? And he says, I will never, ever, ever let go of my embrace of you. Lord Jesus, as we prepare to come to your table, that's what we're about to see pictured for us. That you would come close to us in our deepest pain, in our deepest wounds, in our deepest sin. You would come close and you would not leave us there. And you would not brush over it. You would not skip a passage. No, no, no. You're going to come after Tamar. 
and you're going to hear every little word, and you're going to send your best prophet to comfort her and be with her and care for her. Lord God, do that through your spirit and through the body of Christ. And even now, as we prepare to come to your table, remind us of the links of love and care and pursuit you would come on to claim us and reclaim us and restore us and heal us and make us your own forever and ever. Amen. First of all, I just want to share again, one sermon doesn't even begin to touch the depths of pain we've been talking about today. It's just an invitation to continue that journey. Um, if you're looking for someone you can talk to, a counselor, we'd be glad to help, however we can as a church body, to help and to care. And so I just want to invite that conversation um, to continue, I want to offer myself, and I hadn't asked her, but Nikki, would you stand up real quick? She's a clinical counselor, works right here in our office, dear longtime member of our church. Can't think of anybody I'd trust more. So just wanted to offer those things to you, friends. Um, second of all, as we turn to the Lord's table, um, you know, this sermon that you see represented here says the exact opposite of the sermon we just, or the passage we just read. All this screams is you have a God and a husband who does nothing but pursue you. 
He does not pursue to destroy, but to rescue. You do not have a husband, the Lord Jesus, who has silenced you. Oh, he has listened closely. Look how closely. His body is broken. His blood shed. That's how closely. He has not discarded you. He has not put you away. He has held you so close that this cost of his own blood and pierced hands are we embraced by him. He has not objectified us. If this doesn't scream our worth as his children, his Christ spouse, this shows you your worth. And finally, he does not leave you without hope. He has brought justice first on himself that we could even have a relationship with him. Right? Not because we deserve it. It's only through Christ that any of us can be close to him. And so that's what he screams to us today, even through his supper, what his love looks like. And so as our elders come forward, hear now these words of institution by Christ through the Apostle Paul. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you belong to Christ, if you've experienced his salvation on your life, and if you've been baptized into his people, into his church, you are invited to come and feast on him and receive from him comfort and care and strength through his table and through his nourishment. But if you don't know Christ, I hope what we heard earlier scares you. It should scare you. If you aren't safe in Christ, if his blood is not covering you, you're invited to let these things pass today, but then come talk to someone about how you can know and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's your invitation to experience his salvation in your life and his forgiveness and his protection over you. Let's pray together. Lord God, we come. And we thank you for your table, and we thank you that even the night before you went to all the cross and gave the ultimate act of love, that you gave us pictures of them, bread and wine, as we just think about what that means, what that looks like, Lord. Represent, seal, apply in our lives supernaturally, spiritually, God, what you have done in us. This isn't just a physical thing, this is spiritual that you would nourish us and comfort us and heal us and restore us and draw us closer and closer and closer to you. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would do that through this supper, your Lord's Supper now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're again going to have you um, come forward here. Uh, We're going to have elders at four stations in that corner, right here, right here, and then in that corner. Uh, If you've been with us before, you know we try to use the middle aisle to come forward and then that outside against both walls, that side to come forward and these two little middle areas, you can return to your seat. And so as the Lord leads you to come and to feast on his son and, and experience his grace and mercy, come as you are led. come. If you have a gluten need, I'm going to be having that tray right here myself. So you can come down the middle.
Our Lord Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. body of Christ, which is broken for you, take and eat. The cup of the new covenant in Christ's blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you know us so intimately and so deeply, Father. You know our pain, you know our sin, and you understand and know how this world affects us and impacts us and has uh, shaped our lives. And Father, we thank you that through all of that, you loved us enough to send your son, yourself, to take on the pain and the punishment for us and to redeem us and save us. So, Father, we ask that you would use this time to remind us of that great and deep love for us, Father, and to keep that in the, the front of our minds as we go from this place and back into our lives. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. As we close, uh, I invite you to stand with me and we'll sing the doxology. We, we started our, our service off with a friendly embrace of your brother and sister around you. So I invite you to do the same. Maybe come across the aisle, hold hands, celebrate the fact that we are a, a, a family. And uh, we come to the table together. Three.